Welcome to Money Reimagined. I'm Sheila Warren. Decentralized autonomous organizations, known as DAOs, are a new kind of organizational structure built using blockchain technology. To borrow the definition used by consensus, DAOs are governing bodies that oversee the allocation of resources tied to the projects they're associated with. They're tasked with ensuring the long-term success of the project they support. Now, in the last year, DAOs have seen explosive growth. In 2018, there were around 10 DAOs, but now, according to DeepDAO, there are almost 5,000 unique DAOs with approximately 9.3 billion US dollars in their treasuries. There are currently over 1.7 million token holders and over 650,000 active voters and proposal makers. The theoretical beauty of DAOs is that anyone, anywhere can contribute. Now, while they vary in structure, purpose, and values, the aim is the same, to create an open venue for contributing to a project aligned via organizationally native incentives. A lot of times these incentives can be in the form of tokens, but we've seen the alignment go well beyond just that. For many, DAOs have become a way to find like-minded people all around the world. It's like a college club, but global, and often on Discord, and way, way bigger. Now, finding ways to organize people is a tale as old as time, and, and DAOs are giving us real-time experiments into how new technologies might contribute to shifting long-standing models. In some parts of the world, like the United States, for example, organizing as a group is a highly structured, and in some cases, even regulated process. I'm not talking about the spreadsheet you use to plan your family reunion, though I suppose in some cases I could be. I'm talking about things like C-Corps or LLCs or partnerships, structures most of us have heard of at least, that are in most cases licensed by a governmental body but have certain reporting requirements. In other parts of the world, other sorts of structures are more common, all with their own cultures and processes, and often with community accountability baked in in some informal fashion. So far, we're not quite sure which of these models will apply to DAOs, if any. In an emerging markets which often have more informal structures in place, the transparency and opportunities that DAOs can provide can be quite powerful. Now, DAO evangelists point to a few key features that might make DAOs a better model. First, important decisions can be made on-chain, meaning that they are transparent and include a broader community, those who hold governance tokens. Votes are recorded and appear publicly on a permanent ledger. Second, DAOs may be a more lightweight setup from a legal and operational point of view. Third, it's an opportunity for individuals who may not otherwise be able to get involved, for example, for immigration or visa reasons, to work on Web3 from anywhere. For example, in a September 2021 survey of over 400 DAO contributors, there were 290 cities represented. Countries included the US, China, India, the Philippines, Nigeria, and more. It's really a global way of organizing community. Our guests today will help us understand where DAOs offer value in emerging markets specifically, and how existing traditional structures may not actually be serving people all that well if they're even an option in the first place. That guest is Jeffrey C., the chief DAOist at Poco Technologies, which focuses on replacing LLCs with DAOs in emerging markets. Prior to Poco, Jeffrey launched a digital identity product and onboarded 20 million users in India and Vietnam who'd been left out of legacy financial systems. He also co-founded a social enterprise that created the largest program ever for training female entrepreneurs in North Korea. Before we talk to Jeffrey, let's bring in my co-host, Michael Casey. Hey, Michael. Hey, Sheila. So I'm a hotel room N, number N in our in our <laughs> in our tour uh, at Milken at the Milken conference today, and I was last week at Crypto Bahamas, uh, and I got to say, of course, consensus is coming up in Austin, right? right? You're on the circuit. Pretty different crowds. <laughs> right. It's been interesting being back to the yeah. just the vibe, the attire, right? All of that. Yeah, I, I didn't, I couldn't sadly make it to the Bahamas. I had a bit of FOMO there uh, going on. A bunch of people from Coindesk were, of course, there. The the TV crew were there. Uh, and the footage that came back made it look like, you know, it sounded like it was fun, um, pretty flashy. Uh, you know, Bill Clinton and Tony Blair on stage. It gives you an indication for those of us who are in the events business of how much money is being generated because that's a fairly expensive um, program right there. Uh, and apparently, like, yes, interesting and fun, but not necessarily news breaking. Um, I suppose Milk and I mean, you tell me, but it strikes me as, as a crowd that um, is not exactly crypto native and therefore probably has a different perspective. And consensus is something else altogether. And we are very, uh, 
excited about it. I'll use this shameless pitch as I often do, but <laughs> June 9th to 12th, everybody should be there. And the consensus is, is really different. I mean, we're, we're a news organization. So, you know, we, we drive this around the, the, the importance of the editorial conversation, what is happening. And we, we really want people to be there to actually break news. And so, you know, stuff will happen. Stuff will be announced. There will be developments that are really important to consensus. I'm not sure that was the case in the Bahamas. And I got no idea about Milken. Yeah, well, it's really interesting, right? So to be to go from a crypto conference that was um, run by a company and that had a very particular, it was meant to showcase the Bahamas uh, in many ways, which I think was done very effectively. It was meant to kind of talk through a lot of what's happening in this space and kind of be a place for everyone to come together and, and dive deep on some topics. Milken, not at all a crypto conference, you know, kind of a more historic institution. Uh, quite a few panels here. I'm on one on Web3. There was one uh, talk with crypto pioneers. I think it was what it was called yesterday. And there's other things coming up just on uh, crypt people, uh, crypto, you know, a lot of crypto kind of um, champions or those who are kind of prominent in the space speaking on various panels and topics, everything from, you know, um, national security to foreign affairs and this kind of thing. So, you know, it, but it's fascinating seeing the difference in approach and tone and everything else. And the fact that I think that you have so many places that crypto is coming up as a topic is a really interesting interesting development over the course of the last yeah. couple of years. Yeah. Uh, but here at Milken, you know, emerging markets, not necessarily a huge focus uh, in the Bahamas. One could argue the Bahamas are an emerging market, but I think, you know, pretty advanced in terms of what kind of things they can attract. So I'm eager to talk to our guests today about places that maybe are not having quite the same uh, volume of crypto conferences or flying in all the, you know, the big dogs, mm -hmm. the big celebrities and whatnot. Um, but are critical to the development and advancement of our ecosystem. So I would love to bring in Jeffrey. And I'd love to just start, Jeffrey, by just telling us what is, in your view, the special appeal of DAOs in emerging markets in that context? Yeah. Hi. Thanks. Uh, thanks, Sheila. Thanks for uh, having me on this program. Um, I think for us, in terms of like DAOs um, and kind of how we think about it, I think one is obviously I'm sitting in uh, in Vietnam. I'm operating in places like Central Asia, the Middle East, Latin America. Um, where, uh, you know, it's very, just a very different environment, right? The problem we're trying to solve with DAOs is very different. But I think also just the way I came to crypto, I think you you talk about the work I did in North Korea, where we we're training entrepreneurs there. Uh, and actually, that's how I was introduced to, to, uh, to blockchain and Bitcoin. Um, you know, there's currency reform in North Korea, uh, where the government had everyone change their old currency to a new currency. Uh, they kept the amount people could change, and it basically wiped out the wealth of the entrepreneurial class. Uh, so I was a researcher at MIT at the point in time, uh, and I talked to people about this problem, and they were like, oh, why don't you look at this thing called uh, Bitcoin? Um, and I thought at the time, like, that was the most fascinating technology, but who would buy Bitcoin? Um, clearly wrong, very wrong on that part. But I think it's just, I was introduced to, to crypto through the lens of, like, how do we solve uh, problems in places where institutions, uh, legal institutions are not there, uh, institutions are broken, um, and I think that's the lens in which I look at this problem. So maybe talk a little bit about, uh, if you can, Jeffrey, the, thank you for joining us, by the way. Um, you know, the the sort of idea of empowerment, right? I mean, it, it strikes me that, you know, one of the challenges that we face in a lot of developing countries is sort of wealth gap, for one, which tends to mean there's a concentration of not just money, but also power in the hands of, of gatekeepers. They can be a government or just a local leader or whomever, and that, that th those individuals get to control and have a say in what's happening. Um, how do you see DAOs potentially allowing for more empowerment from folks who might otherwise not you know, be constrained by those gatekeepers um, in, in terms of their ability to actually take charge of their lives? Yeah. So, so we see DAOs as really powerful vehicles for entrepreneurship in this market. Uh, in many places we operate in, it's not like the US, it's not like Singapore, where setting up a company is actually uh, is a is fairly cheap process. And you get a lot of uh, kind of bang for your buck for, for setting up a company, you know, because you have a strong legal system, uh, a rule of law that protects you and your assets. Uh, whereas in many of these places, uh, you know, you, you can spend actually quite a lot of money setting up a company, you don't get a lot of protection, um, and you don't have a vehicle to, to kind of launch the next big thing. I think DAOs are powerful because if you think about what it does in these markets is that it allows people to create a, a organization entity uh, at very low cost. Um, it gives the governance on-chain 
is in some ways comparable, if not better, than some of the legal protections you get in the market, kind of in with the company structures in these areas. And you're plugged into a very interoperable system. Like in many of these places, you don't actually have um, developed public markets. So setting as a DAO means you can fundraise, uh, you can almost like list your companies uh, in ways that you can't do with, with a normal structure. So I think it's just an amazing tool for entrepreneurship for anyone who wants to create something. Uh, and it's accessible to people that traditionally don't have the resource to get access to these kinds of structures. This is really interesting, Jeffrey. And so, so one thing that comes up a lot in DAOs in the U.S. context, right, is, well, what about, you know, liability? And it, we're a very litigious, litigation-oriented society here in America. And so the question often comes up, you know, who do you sue if something goes wrong with the DAO? And so yeah. how do you think about consequences, right? If something were to go wrong within a DAO structure, how do you think about protecting the people that are involved in it? So one of the benefits of an LLC or a C corporation is creating what's called the corporate veil. So you can protect assets, individual assets using a corporate structure. You can get insurance right on the corporate structure versus individually having to hold that insurance. So there's a layer of separation and this fiction that we allow that a corporation functions like a, a person, like an entity that has its own identity, its own ability to transact in the marketplace uh, is designed in part to provide protection for those who are uh, in, in leadership roles, let's say, or, or engaged with it. So how does that translate to uh, the DAO structure in your mind? And also tell us a bit, if you will, in, in, in the course of answering that question, uh, what you're up to at POCO, which I find so interesting. Yeah. So um, uh, so at POCO, we basically built DAOs uh, to replace companies in emerging markets. Uh, our lens on the problem is very much shaped by the environment we're in, where these existing structures uh, are just not great. For, for serving entrepreneurs. Um, and we do it by creating a governance structure that looks like a company. Uh, and we build legal, kind of what we think of legal bridges to off-chain assets, right? So uh, allowing the DAOs to kind of interact with um, off-chain assets and to own off-chain assets. Um, I think in terms of the legal liability, so I think our starting point is that when we, I think the US is a very unique uh, system where uh, the rule of law and the legal infrastructure is just amazing. So uh, people think a lot about these issues. But I kind of think about the places I operate in. Often, if you try to sue someone, uh, you try to sue a company, uh, things get gum up in the courts for, you know, maybe like 10 years, you know, trying to foreclose on a property. Um, or, or, you know, it, it, it just doesn't work. You just can't sue people. So I give an example. Like um, uh, my wife and I were actually supposed to get married uh, in a developing country. I shall not name names here. Um, and this was during COVID-19. Borders got shut down. So we couldn't get into the country where we're supposed to hold the wedding. The wedding planner runs off with the wedding deposit. So we have a contract. We go to the police and we say, hey, you know, can you help us kind of like find the, the, the wedding planner? And the police says, you pay me $5,000 and then I'll go find a person, uh, which is, you know, was like kind of classic pointless. story. <laughs> Yeah, just absolutely so, classic. It reminds, yeah, absolutely. So I mean, I mean, that's the lens in which we have in, in this market. The legal infrastructure is just not as uh, kind of um, uh, kind of as developed. So uh, like suing people, uh, suing company and people behind a company, this market already is a very challenging process. Uh, so you know, with the DAOs, I think it's a fairly secondary concern. I think for for most of the DAOs that we work with, they're essentially establishing themselves uh, in in this market. I mean. Uh, we are building structures where we basically, in a sense, borrow the jurisdictions outside of the country to provide that kind of um, uh, kind of liability protection. So basically, kind of um, in, in sense, offshoring the jurisdiction of uh, these entities. Uh, but you know, again, I think in this market, uh, the existing structures um, they just don't really uh, kind of have that kind of protections in place. So, however, though, I mean, clearly the law is the law and the law will always be there. And it's, you know, it's like you have to operate in the context of a legal framework. Um, so with that in mind, you know, how do you think about um, what exists, exi you know, in different parts of the world, different, different countries? I mean, and how ready are they to interface with these sorts of legal questions? I mean, you're going to have to have some way of recognizing the rights of the participants in those DAOs that it's recognized by law, right? Um, and there's a whole host of different crypto laws 
uh, in you know, around the world constantly being awry. We just heard, you know, Panama now has just released a whole suite of, of new laws around crypto. And I don't know whether you've got a chance to look at that, but whether or not, you know, those developments are compatible with um, a DAO solution uh, is something I'd, I'd like to hear your thoughts on. It, you know, do we... Can, can these things coexist with the traditional legal structure? Yeah, I think, um, you know, the long term aim is how do we move more of this governance on chain? But I think we do live in a messy world where you have to interact with assets that are essentially off chain and you need to tap into the existing legal infrastructure in the world in the world today. So I think that's not going to go away as a problem anytime soon. Uh, I've not looked at the Panama um, legislation uh, and regulations yet, but I think generally the way I've seen uh, this regulations develop in places like Wyoming, um, Tennessee, and, and kind of more broadly the discussion around DAO and, and regulations uh, or legislation is, is that I think the direction of travel uh, is, is wrong. So we are for, we're kind of trying to fit um, DAOs into an existing kind of legal framework. Um, and it's not very suitable because the technology and the regulations are just kind of, you know, basically building, built in a different era, right? Uh, and instead, I think we should be thinking about how do we build regulation around the technology? So I think as a parallel to that, uh, you know, I think about, say, if, if I went to a bank and told them about this thing called crypto today, I think they would be lost at what to do with it. I think similar to DAO, right? You go to an existing framework and you say, hey, my DAO essentially can be a public company from day one. You know, I can list my tokens anywhere around the world, across all these different markets. Uh, I have a bank built into a DAO as it is. Uh, I have governance built into a DAO. So it's a very different entity from a company, uh, but we are trying to kind of like force fit this DAO into legislation that was built for a very different kind of like structure and technology. Uh, so I think, um, I think that's the challenge with, with kind of regulation in this space. It's kind of fitting things that are different together. Yeah, I, I'm going to spare you my usual rant on, you know, how we can't backwards engineer existing regulations and, and try to force new technologies to, to afford with them. Here in the United States, we've talked on the show a lot about how our securities laws date back to the 1930s and were formulated after the Great Depression, right? One could argue that, you know, the Great Depression kind of thinking continues and it's all cyclical, but... I'd argue that the 1930s are not really a great place for us to, to look and, and think we have a comprehensive overview of what's happening in any ecosystem, particularly not in technical way. Um, and so the question I have for you, though, is, you know, the regulations are changing. This is a rapidly moving landscape, as you and I have discussed. And so how do you kind of locate DAOs within a shifting regulatory landscape where things are not certain? It's not entirely clear what's going to have to regulation, I would say at this point, almost anywhere in the world. Even the recent rules that came down in Panama are very new and could evolve and, and change. So gee, it sounds to me like what you're saying is that moving things on chain can provide some stability in an uncertain regulatory and legal environment. But to Michael's point, you are going to have to operate within whatever environment winds up being relevant to whatever project you're, you're engaging with, right? So if you wind up engaging with health data, for example, within a DAO, you're going to have to comply with the rules around health data and its portability or whatever, depending on the jurisdiction you're in. So there are these other laws that also come into play. But I'm just curious, how do you, how do you think about any of this from the, the crypto regulatory standpoint? Is it the case that you're saying moving things on chain can provide some more stability? And, and how do you think about that shifting environment? Yeah, so um, I think it's a great point because I think when we think about the global landscape, um, it is a very complicated picture, especially outside of the US. But I think there's an advantage is that US laws tend to be extraterritorial, whereas most of the world do not have, uh, most of the world do not have extraterritorial laws um, in terms of how it's being implemented. And it gives an opportunity to say, how do I kind of abstract away from all this complexity in all these different markets and find one hub that can create the right regulation that would service uh, many markets in the world. Uh, and we actually work with a number of uh, jurisdictions to uh, kind of approach uh, regulation from, from this angle, right? How do you redesign uh, regulation around the technology? Um, and, and kind of build it up from, from scratch. Uh, and I think the, the key difference here um, uh, in terms of how uh, we approach it is that 
when you think about um, say uh, for example like the the securities law uh, you think of company law you think about uh, banking law I think you need to kind of find a jurisdiction that's fairly new that don't have as much established interest uh, in this space um, because they, you know, like, like you quickly run up against um, existing interest groups, right? So, for example, like the banking sector is a very established financial hub. The banking sector is going to have a lot of issues uh, with crypto because it might get the banking hub put on the FATF's uh, gray list, uh, you know, if, if uh, there's a lot of crypto activity there. Uh, so you need to find places that actually, uh, in a sense, are building from scratch. And I think that's where a lot of these frontier countries are actually quite interesting. Because they, uh, a lot of them actually have very strong technical talent. They want to build themselves out as a Web3 hub, create jobs for uh, the developer community. Um, but at the same time, they don't have as much established interest uh, that would kind of block the development of the sector um, as you would say, you know, in, in, a, in a big financial hub like Singapore or, you know, the US where there's a lot of other industries that could be disrupted by, by this technology. So, Jeffrey, I couldn't agree more. I mean, I think that one of the reasons we've seen such pickup and adoption in frontier economies is because uh, it's harder, I think. It has been harder for crypto to take foothold where, A, a lot of people were served by existing systems and didn't really feel the pain points that early crypto projects that were mostly financially oriented were designed to solve, number one. Number two, it was really hard to know how to locate a crypto project within a space that was already highly regulated or had a lot of legal structure around it. So I love this point that not only is adoption the same places where we can actually help people immediately and solve very real problems with this technology are the same places that don't have that same uh, really robust or really firm infrastructure legally or in a regulatory environment around these kinds of opportunities, which I find really interesting that those things go together. Um, now, the flip of that, of course, which is really interesting, is perhaps the reason that legacy financial systems have more of a foothold and are serving more people is because of that very strong regulatory environment. So it'll be interesting to see if DAOs become the kind of uh, organizing structure of the realm in a way, right? And a lot of the regulatory infrastructure is built around them. It may be that DAOs evolve to be the thing that really does serve people in these frontier economies and these environments because they're there is a corresponding infrastructure in the regulatory and legal environment that's built alongside it, focused on this new innovation. Is that something that you see happening anywhere in the world? Yeah. Um, so we we kind of work in um, you know many places. So so we see many countries that actually were introduced to crypto through uh, say the mining community, right? So you see places like Georgia, Kazakhstan. Um, that started out with crypto mining, um, you know, and, and they say, oh, you know, it's, it's an interesting industry, it's providing jobs, it's bringing uh, technology in some ways to, uh, to the local economy. Um, and then they build from there, right? They establish, uh, say, their own crypto regulators uh, to say, oh, yeah, how do we further build out uh, this industry? And I think, um, so for example, you know, in, in, um, uh, in Kazakhstan, they actually set up a separate um, kind of uh, international financial center and they set up a separate crypto regulator uh, for the market uh, with the view that, you know, they, they started to realize and seeing how different it was uh, from the regular industries uh, and how it had to be regulated in its own way, kind of um, tailored to uh, to the technology. So it's kind of interesting. It's, it's just in this frontier markets, you see that development of the industry, you know, going from mining uh, to kind of more advanced forms of uh, regulation, um, kind of trying to promote kind of different uh, aspects of the overall industry in these places. Um, also, kind of just in places like Vietnam, uh, you know, we just see a lot of use of, uh, so I think it was, the highest crypto adoption in the world, according to Chainalysis. Uh, you know, I spent a lot of time in Vietnam with product engineering in Vietnam. Um, and it's just, it, it fits a very, very different use case in the country. Uh, just because, uh, you know, there's capital controls and, you know, people don't have a financial kind of very established public market to invest in. And they also can't invest abroad because of capital controls. So young people are kind of moving into digital assets as the only way to guard against uh, inflation. So very different use cases in all these markets leading to, I think, very different developments uh, uh, in both in terms of regulation, but also in terms of people's behavior. 
I just, I just want to just pause and reflect on that data point, right? That, that uh, Vietnam, you know, the, the, the highest level of, of adoption in the world. Like it just, it just speaks to how important this sort of regulatory framework, the kind of legal historical framework in which people interact with money really impacts, um, you know, how this technology and, and the capabilities that it has, the opportunities it provides. Um, I think that uh, you kind of, the way you've been talking about this actually, Jeffrey, is to see almost as if regulation, we can view it in the same way we think about like infrastructure. People talk about the capacity of, of emerging markets to leapfrog with you know, mobile computing, for example. Like, oh, they don't, they don't need to worry about all the legacy phone wires because they've, they'll just leapfrog into, into to mobile phones. And we've seen that right across the developing world. But you're almost talking about leapfrogging in, re, in regulatory structure as well. And that like, you don't have to unwind the existing legacy regulatory framework. You can go ahead and build something new that's much more aligned and attuned to these new technologies and, the new, and these new frameworks. So I just think that's just a fascinating way to think about why the emerging market use case, not just for DAOs, but for crypto generally, is so interesting. Um, what I would like to do, though, as well, is just to drill down a little bit into actual sort of like real use cases. You talked about how this is a great tool for entrepreneurs. But, you know, are there specific areas, and I'm just going to just pick a pet topic of mine. You can tell me whether it's a crazy idea or not, but I've always been interested in solar microgrids. And I think that, you know, one of the things that's really important for the development of any country, of course, is access to energy. And the sun is everywhere, right? Um, the, the best way I would see to actually start to uh, you know, obviously attack climate change, but also uh, empower communities who have been removed from, uh, you know, the sort of centralized generation and, and power uh, d distribution is to actually tap into those renewable on ground sources, whether it's wind, solar or, you know, hydro. But, the, the, but you could create ownership structures around that that don't that allow the community to actually build around it. So I've always thought a DAO would be a great way to structure a microgrid where everybody has, a, you know, a, a claim on, on a set of solar panels, for example, um, and there's a, a system by which that, that those funds are traded and used. Are those sorts of ideas, whether it's solar or other forms of infrastructure uh, at all being considered in DAOs and the developing world? And if not, what really are the great use cases that you're seeing? Yeah, I, I think, uh, I mean, it's a great point. It's a very, very interesting example. Uh, honestly, though, I haven't actually seen, you know, like people coming to us and say, oh, you know, I want to build something as ambitious as that in, in, in the markets we are operating in. And maybe it's just the fact that it's early and, you know, those is a very sophisticated integration of kind of um, off-chain physical infrastructure with blockchain technology that is still very hard to execute um, in most places around the world. But what we have seen, and I think where this is really interesting to some of these frontier markets is that uh, many of them are not, um, they're, they're kind of cut off from kind of the, the core, I think, uh, entrepreneurial ecosystems. Uh, but Web3, I think, creates this great leveling field because you can create something that generates immense value because you immediately reach customers uh, across the world. So an example of that is that I, you know, in Vietnam, I had a mentee. And, you know, like five years ago when I was introduced to him, he was running a game studio, five uh, programmers, uh, and, and graphic designers uh, kind of like sitting in a game studio, like a cramped room with like broken lights, like kind of creating games. And, and that's what they love. And then last year, I found out that, oh, they had launched a play to earn game um, called Titan Arena. It had reached like a $4 billion coin cap last year. Uh, and I was just amazed, you know, and they are sitting in Vietnam and I asked them like, where's your customer? And they're like, oh, uh, it's from Brazil, from Philippines. They're literally all over the world. Um, and you don't see that kind of phenomenal success for, for most startups in these places. But I think uh, Web3 has kind of created uh, the access to opportunity and a much more global market uh, and also a much more global way to fundraise, to fund creating a business um, that many of these kind of frontier hubs just traditionally don't have access to. And I think those are some of the interesting uh, cases that we've seen popped up. Uh, like a lot in gaming, uh, kind of various aspects of um, like creator type projects. Um, uh, that's that's kind of just getting a global audience that they otherwise would find and struggle to to achieve. 
you know, so when you say that they're cut off from entrepreneurial ecosystems, I think what you're really referring to is kind of traditional forms of funding, right? So venture funding, things like uh, combinators or, you know, a boot camp where you yeah. can kind of come together and have that kind of thing happen that's going to give you then as the follow on, give you access to a lot of funders that can kind of help back your company, get a lot of marketing boost and all that kind of stuff. I mean, I think anyone who's lived in a frontier economy knows that the one thing not lacking is hustle and grit and resilience, right? And so it's really, um, I think it's going to be revolution. It's already revolutionary. It will continue to be revolutionary just seeing what happens when you connect that spark and that kind of cultural norm with uh, a funding model behind it, right? That funding model that has baked into it this kind of accountability. Um, but one thing I want to chat about a little here is, you know, there are, I've been in, I've, I've been uh, stalking a little bit, a bunch of whole, a bunch of DAOs on Discord and, and I kind of move in and out of a lot of them. And some are, you know, really well organized and lovely environments. And you kind of leave feeling very empowered and all this kind of thing. Others are just absolutely toxic cesspools and you like, you feel like dirty. I've been having seen what's going on and I'm like terrible. And so a lot of that is a function of the people that are within these communities. And so I wonder how can we incentivize this more community orientation, this kind of pro-social orientation to things? Is that just about passion for the project or are there maybe ways of even organizing something, I use Discord as one example, but kind of organizing even the communication that happens in DAOs, are there ways of doing that that you think are more incentivizing more positive and community-oriented behavior versus not? Yeah. Um, interesting. It's an interesting question because um, I remember in the early days of, of the internet, right? You go to all these forums online and people behave in ways that they would never behave if you meet them face to face, right? People say things that <laughs> are just truly offensive yep. or rude. <laughs> <laughs> um, and or, or aggressive, uh, which you never do if you you meet someone in person. Uh, and I think you see a lot of that behavior kind of being translated into uh, into the sector. Um, I think that anonymity can be both a, a blessing and a curse uh, in the sense that you know people just behave in in very different ways uh, as they would in in a face to face interaction. Um, how we solve it, you know, I think. Um, uh, it's interesting as we, you know, I, I don't have the solution here. I think it's just that we will build new norms, uh, you know, as as more of the interaction move online, whether it's in the metaverse, you're meeting someone, you know, someone's digital avatar, um, or you have kind of chat groups uh, like Discord that become more interactive. Um, you know, I don't know whether as we develop more of an identity online, uh, it makes us more conscious of how we carry ourselves. Um, and I think maybe some of those digital identity solutions that are being developed for the blockchain uh, would kind of create uh, pressure for people to behave in ways that are, uh, in a sense, nicer, right, to to each other. I don't think it's 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 bad in a sense to lose some of the anonymity, um, you know, and kind of creating a reputation online. And I think maybe that would create some mechanisms to get people to police their own behavior. So uh, just one last question, perhaps, Jeffrey, and then we may need to wrap here. But like, what, are you th what needs to happen in terms of education? I mean, sh surely some of these ideas are still very esoteric and difficult for, for I mean, they're anybody anywhere. This is, doesn't really matter whether it's emerging markets or uh, developed countries. Uh, these are kind of complex concepts. Um, you know, what, what have you thought about in terms of how do you bring the general population uh, to get interested and engaged and participating? In these uh, in these projects, yeah. So I think the, the 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 fundamental part of the product we build at Coco, um, which is the governance uh, smart contract, the way we think about it is that we we say how do we make it look more like a company, uh, and it's tied to the the fact that we're trying to replace companies in the markets we operate in. But I think the important part of that is that uh, people invest in structures that they understand. So a lot of investors say, oh, you know, I'm from the US, I would only invest in a Delaware company, maybe in a Cayman company, I would not invest even say in a Singapore company, for example, because they know what a Delaware company is, they know what a Cayman company is. And I think similarly, similarly, kind of when we create DAOs, we need to think of who uh, is the audience, uh, who is the more mainstream audience that we are trying to, to, to reach, and how do we kind of build a structure that's familiar to them, so that they they know what they're getting into, uh, and and it's accessible to them. So I think that's that's how we think about uh, you know how do we bring this into a mainstream audience, 
um, uh, you know, and also same for the entrepreneurs, right? Entrepreneurs are used to companies where there is a fair degree of centralization. Um, and it's fine if, say, a DAO starts out being centralized. Uh, over time, as the community grows, it kind of loses out that centralization. Um, but it doesn't have to start out from day one as a you know fully decentralized uh, entity. So I think those are things that we try to do to kind of make the DAOs, put the DAOs into a format that uh, you know the builders, uh, the investors understand. Well, Jeffrey, this is absolutely fascinating. It's it's fascinating to think about how the empowerment, the agency, the community engagement that uh, DAOs in their best form, recognizing that there are other things that can happen along the way in their best form, can provide to a project could actually inform the regulatory landscape and create a uh, guardrails around kind of what to do and not to do in that space, that we might actually have an entire emerging regulatory and legal scheme in certain parts of the world, particularly grounded in frontier economies, that supports this new way of doing business, literally of doing business. This has been a, a huge tour of kind of what's happening there. So thank you so much for that. Thank you also, as always, to my co-host, Michael Casey, and to all of you for listening and viewing. Stay tuned next week for another episode of Money Reimagined.